So I'm Ross Dawson, uh, here with uh, Gerd Leonard. Uh, we're both uh, futurists. Uh, I live in Australia and Gerd lives in Switzerland. And we uh, happen to be physically in the same place, so uh, having conversation uh, today about the extinction or possible extinction of newspapers. So a little while ago, I released this chart showing where uh, the years in which uh, newspapers would become extinct or irrelevant, rather, in uh, uh, every country around the world, and it got a got an interesting response. So, good. What, what do you think? Uh, do you think newspapers will become extinct? Yeah, I always, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the sector, and, and and my main point is always: Are we interested in news, or are we interested in paper? Right. So, I think the paper business and printing and trucking and shipping, yep. we can do without that. You know, I mean, it's bad for the people printing and driving the trucks; they have to look for other work, right? But it's about news, right? It's about what actually is there, right? So if we yep. drop the paper from newspaper, I think we'll be just fine because that's yes. also 80% of the money spent on newspapers and magazines is not the content. Right? It's not the making of the content, it is the distribution of it, right? So it's also better for the environment, you know, to not print as much as it allegedly is. Um, but I think the situation really as, it, as it's right now is that I don't, I don't think print will die but it will definitely not grow. <laughs> so uh, to me, I like print for certain occasions, but in general, I think we're looking at cutting off the paper of the news part and saying, yeah. let's grow the news business. You know, there is great demand there. And just like the music industry, there's great demand in music, but let's not record necessarily, sell recorded music, right? We can look a different direction. There's a good business there. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I call it news on paper rather than newspapers because uh, that's, what it is and distinguish, distinguishes that news and paper part. And so to, I've, I've been getting caught up a lot in these uh, questions and discussions about, you know, whether newspapers will die or when they will die. And, and to a point, that's uh, not as interesting as what is the future of news, because less and less will be on paper. Yes, part will be on paper, though I think that will become uh, you know, very uh, unimportant in the broader picture. But the future of news is a far richer subject around where, what are the distribution mechanisms, how, what is the role of journalists, paid and unpaid, or contributors to that, how do we filter that news, uh, and clearly more and more of those delivery mechanisms are digital, but what will they look like, and how common, how similar will the news that I see be to the news that you see? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of issues here, but of course, there's many positive things, for example, the the fact that more and more people are writing stuff and blogging and Twittering and whatever, Facebook updating, whatever, I think that means that a lot more professional uh, filtering is needed, right? So the, the flood of content means I need really good journalists to help me go through that, right? So the need is there, the demand is there, the delivery is getting cheaper, all these things are good, right? That, that's, that's a good yeah. development. And now we have to basically say, okay, how do we make a business model out of that? And to say, for example, uh, the, the biggest conflict here being paywalls and those kind of things, right? Yes. Uh, if we're going to say now, all of a sudden, the consumer has to pay for news, well, basically they never paid for news because it was paid for by advertising, uh, in some cases by subscriptions, but by and large, it's a third-party pays model. For, for online news, yeah, the, the no, people no. that bought, bought, phys usually physically bought the newspapers. Yeah, though. they bought the newspaper, but it wasn't sufficient to actually pay for what it costs. Right? Yeah, for yeah, example, you yeah. can get Wired magazine for 10 bucks a year. That's not enough to ship it and print <laughs> it, right? But the reason that you bought it for 10 bucks a year is because you can be sold as an, as an, as an, an eyeball, right? Yes. Right? So I think that is the way we have to look forward is to say, okay, how are we going to get this kind of ad supported mechanism into the news of the future so we can afford the content creation? Right. That's a key question, and that requires sort of a new ecosystem of advertisers, device makers, content makers, you know, all, yeah. all this thing together. So part, part of it is, you know, the, the famous long tail means that we are able to get for small, more and more smaller audiences, and this creates a far larger market, because now we can access micro markets as well as the larger markets, mm -hmm. and the, you don't have the, the costs of, you know, for example, printing and distributing to access those. And but what it also means is that this money, uh, yeah, advertising money, basically is spread more thinly, and so we're starting to get these smaller and smaller niches. So creation of these multi-niche strategies, where there are some big mass markets uh, remaining, there are fewer of them, and they are not as large. But basically, when you have to scale the costs commensurate with revenues, 
then that requires a dramatically different model. And you know, I think more and more of it's this creation of these multi-niche uh, news or uh, you know, media offerings, which access a, a micro community, can be very highly targeted in their advertising, have lower costs to produce, and they, they can be uh, cross-subsidization of the, of the costs of uh, creating these multi-niches, but each one of those viable in its own right. Well, m my view is I think that uh, people will pay for value when they see value, and the, and the job of the magazine or newspaper publisher is to demonstrate that value so that I can touch it right, and then decide to pay for it. If I'm being forced to, to pay before I see the value, I just won't pay. Uh, because you know, in a way, of course, I can I can tap into the river of news in many different ways now. Right? But if I like, for example, really strong curation in the financial sector, then I go to the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. I'm happy to pay, right? But I have to see the value first. Right? So we take a tool like Flipboard or so. If there would be something like Flipboard Plus, to where I can get all the extra values with the publisher, yeah. I'd be happy to pay. That alone, I think, can be as big as cable TV, uh, as far as the value generation is being concerned. Yeah. So one of the challenges there is that, you know, Rupert Murdoch, for example, with his The Daily iPad app, you know, it's an interesting venture. And I think, but one of the real challenges there is, does anybody want to go to a single source for news? I mean, there is the value of you get an understood editorial stance, who are selecting stories which, you know, you understand the base on which they've been selected, and maybe they're interesting, and you feel you've covered the scope. but. I think that more and more people want to be able to get these multiple perspectives. So you don't just want the news that comes from the Times or just the news that comes from the Daily yeah. or just the news that comes from uh, the Huffington Post. And so it's harder and harder for the existing media companies to say, this is the slice which is the newspaper or the news on paper or the online news site when uh, people are looking for this aggregation. So aggregation is a bit of a dirty word in the, the media industry yet. That is where a lot of the value resides in being able to present what is valuable to an individual. I mean, as, as, as we discussed earlier, I think that we're, we're in the middle of the shift from what I call the ego system, you know, which is completely mine and you're inside of my thing, right? For example, Disney, Universal Studios, The Wall Street Journal, you're inside of this and the ecosystem, which is a connected system, right? So there's a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, YouTube is an ecosystem, right? And MTV is an ecosystem. So the question is, how do we get from A to B? And this is a painful transition, but the future is ecosystems with very few ecosystems left. And if you're going to build an ecosystem, I think it'll be quite diff difficult. Now it's possible, but uh, the future of news to me is to create a really powerful ecosystem that makes sense, as you were saying, sharing uh, perspectives and creating some sort of serendipity as well. Yes. And this is this is the key, right? And that is the value to me. Uh, so it's a reinvention process, which I think is, is painful, but good news, as I was saying earlier, people want news, people generate news, people are willing to pay for online content, right? professional users are needed and, and, and curators, so that's all good. We just have to invent the ecosystem pretty much from scratch now, and this is quite a challenge. Yeah, and the challenge being most of the news on paper purveyors are uh, come from an ecosystem as you described it and it's very difficult to make that shift from uh, to, a, to a broader space but uh, those are very likely the spaces that will win well thanks for tuning in uh, you can uh, visit Ross's site what's what's your site rossdawson.com well, or course. just search for Ross Dawson okay and mine is mediafuturist.com and uh, thanks for tuning in and listening to us uh, delivering our diatribes thanks <laughs>